Our praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek his forgiveness, his guidance, and his assistance. And we take refuge with him from the evil within our souls and from the consequence of our misdeeds. Whoever Allah gives guidance to, none can mislead, and whoever misleads, none can guide. I bear witness that there's nothing and no one worthy of worship besides Allah alone. He has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his servant and messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him peace, mercy, and to extend to him our salutations on this blessed and special day, during this blessed and special month, just as we ask him to grant peace to his family members, his companions, and all those who follow in goodness and practice goodwill into the meeting and the reckoning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought us to two-thirds of the month of Ramadan in our fast. Fast on these long days, hot days. And I would say that, alhamdulillah, it has been relatively easy, at least for me, uh, and hopefully it has been the same for the rest of you up to this point. Uh, a sign of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this ummah uh, that this has been the case. The month of Ramadan has many different designations, many different names. The month of Ramadan is known as the month of endurance or shahr al-sabr, the month of patience, perseverance. It is known as the month of gratitude, shahr al-shukr, the month of gratitude. It is known as the month of consolation, al-muwasat. It is the time when Muslims themselves try to console the poor uh, in the community uh, uh, um, uh, during this month uh, and it is also known as month, uh, the month of altruism, uh, Shahr al Ithar. It has many different names, many different designations. But this month, this month, Ramadan, Shahr Ramadan, is a month of the commemoration, the celebration of the Quran. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in his holy book, Shahr Ramadan al ladi unzila fihi al Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month wherein the Quran was revealed. Nas as a guidance for humanity. Will be Yunatim min al-Huda and clarifications of that guidance for Quran. And the criterion, the criterion of determining truth from falsehood, good from bad, what is moral from that which is immoral. That the Quran is that Quran for the believer. And so this is a month of a commemoration of this event wherein during the night of power, known as later to Qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent the book uh, down from the Lawh al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet, into the lowest heaven, into Bayt al-Izza, the house of, of, of honor, uh, uh, into, which is found in the lowest heaven. And then after that, over a period of 23 years, he continued to send down different verses and chapters of it to the Prophet Muhammad So we're celebrating guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I do think that during this blessed month, it is important as well to call our attention at times to some things that were very special that happened during the life of the Prophet and then even during the lives of some, some other great sages uh, of his, amongst his companions and others. Uh, the month of Ramadan is not only these things that has is mentioned, but a number of important events happened during the month of Ramadan. Two days ago, if my calculations are correct on the 17th day of Ramadan was what we call the Ghazwat Badr al-Kubra, the Battle of Badr, which it is termed. And it happened on the 17th of the month of Ramadan. Today, the 19th of the month of Ramadan was the day when Ibn al-Muljam stabbed Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu uh, an and uh, and, and among the lessons we learned from that is that a Muslim, uh, even a Muslim at times, will stab you in the back. Not only metaphorically, but even physically. And this can happen when we have an ideological or philosophical difference. You know, and see, so we see this, Ibn Muslim himself, being a Muslim, you know, was led to an extreme and then did what he did on this particular day. And then tomorrow, um, tomorrow will be uh, a, 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 a commemoration of the conquest of Mecca, because the conquest of Mecca happened on the 20th of the month of Ramadan. 
Now, see, there's things we keep in, to, keep in mind as we go through this month. And we should take the opportunity during these days to reflect and return to these stories, to try to see what lesson we can extract from them, uh, what lessons are there during these days. And we know that the last 10 days of the month of Ramadan are months of, of days of ishtihad, the days of due diligence that the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged us to do our utmost during these nights in order to seek out the night of power and hopefully that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants, grants us the, the blessing, the great blessing of that night, the reward of which is like the reward of a, an entire life, lifetime of a human being. But I do want to come back, even though today is, would be the commemoration of the assassination on Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's life, uh, but rather I actually want to go back to reflect upon lessons from the battle of Badr. And one of the reasons is that when we think about the Prophet Muhammad and especially in light of current events and the type of pressures that Muslims find themselves under, that there is the tendency, there's the tendency to, I guess you would say, to um, perhaps whitewash even the prophetic ethos. In the same way that some people would like to whitewash the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. or the legacy of Malcolm X, and then some recently, uh, our most uh, recent departed Muhammad Ali, that some would like to as well, just to simply portray him as an individual who was not concerned with the struggles of the people, of his own people to begin with, you know, but struggles for injustice in, uh, in uh, um, society overall. But there's a, there's a tendency, I would say, that Muslims have developed is to emphasize the compassion and the mercy and the softness of the Prophet ﷺ. And there is definitely, he was definitely soft and compassionate and gentle individual. That was his norm. But there also was a very firm side, sometimes an abrasive side to the Prophet ﷺ. That he is described in the books of Sirah as a person uh, who did not seek vengeance for himself. Uh, unless the sanctities of God were then violated, then he was found to be firm and, and, and abrasive and stern. As a matter of fact, in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Prophet وسلم, with regard to his being challenged by the mushrikeen, those who actually tried to kill him and kill his companions and, and succeeded in doing so in certain cases, that he says to him, Jahid al Kufara wa Munafiqina wa alayhim, that wage. Uh, struggle against the rejectors of faith and the, the, the hypocrites and the rejectors of faith and show them sternness, show them some abrasiveness. And he also says the same thing to other believers. Let them feel some abrasiveness in you. So we have to remember that when we, when we talk about the Prophet, that we want to give the entire, the whole picture of the Prophet, that there are certain instances where he himself did show a certain type of abrasiveness and rightfully so when certain types of sanctities were being challenged. And so the Battle of Badr is an extremely an important event in the life of, of uh, or the history of Islam that we should reflect upon during these blessed days, during these blessed months. As I said, that his ethos was that of one of a very gentle and kind uh, person overall. But his ethos was also, also one of a man of justice and courage and even a warrior. The Prophet ﷺ was even a warrior. Uh, and actually there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, He said, the worst traits in any person, and in particular a man, the worst traits to be found in a man are worried stinginess and petrifying cowardice. Worry and stinginess, like some people, you know, you ask them for, for you ask them for money, you know, they don't want to give. They give anyway, but some people that they, they're always on edge. Shukran had it. They don't want to give a, anything at all. But the worst thing that can be in a person are those two characteristics. And then a type of petrifying cowardice where a person is led to the point that he would not even defend him, himself or his own family. And so why are these in, the important, these characteristics important? Because when it comes to the defense of the community, 
that sometimes you have to go into your pocket. If anything, much of it you have to, you have to go into your pocket in order to preserve the community. When we look in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He actually talks about uh, that those people who Allah will replace if they turn their backs, that those verses are typically in the context of people who refuse to spend feasibility. And feasibility meant those who defend for the defense of the community. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about, He said, And spin in the way of Allah and do not throw your, cast yourselves into destruction with your own hands. A verse which is often quoted as evidence that it's haram to smoke cigarettes. But when we look at the context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually talking about spending in the way of, 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 of the defense of the community. Right? And so, so you have to be an individual who overcomes your stinginess. And then you can't be a person of cowardice because sometimes you may be required to defend your, 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 yourself, or defend your, fam uh, defend your family, or defend your community physically, that it, be, it may happen uh, at times. And one thing we learn when we look at the different uh, expeditions of the Prophet, going back to emphasizing, yes, that his norm was one of a gentle, being a gentle person. And even when we look at the different expeditions, that it actually comes out when you look at the very fact that the Prophet وسلم, actually throughout his career as the messenger of Allah had only 29 military expeditions. And of those 29, 11, there was fighting in only 11 of them. So about uh, one third of those. And over the period of his life, and you know, when we look at the wars between the Muslims and the non-Muslims during that time, that less than 1,700 or about 1,700 casualties actually uh, uh, happened in these particular battles. So he wasn't a bloodthirsty person, that he preferred peace over war. But it is something we need to reflect upon. And cowardice is something which is blameworthy. Uh, even certain Sahaba, that we find that the Prophet like some, some policy was a policy of voluntary service. Not all the men had to even serve. Those men who had the physical capacity to fight, they were encouraged to fight. Those who had the arms to fight, they were encouraged to fight. But those who, even if they had the arms and the physical capacity to fight, that they felt so fearful to do so, the Prophet didn't force them to come to the battle. And one of those people was Hassan ibn Thabit, the famous poet, for defending, known for his poetry for defending the Prophet ﷺ. His biographers describe him of a person of extreme cowardice. That, you know, and this is not meant to uh, denigrate him, but it's just basically, it's one of just highlighting the fact that the Prophet ﷺ, the service is voluntary. And so, 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 so that is one thing, because the Prophet ﷺ wanted people to be rewarded for the decisions they made. And, and he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would only reward you if you do something willfully. It's one of the same reasons why certain things continue to be lawful in Islam and the Prophet didn't prohibit them. It was because he wanted people to willfully abandon certain types of things. All throughout the Quran, it's, Allah is reminding us that, that it, the, the messenger's duty is only to give a clear uh, proclamation well, lest alayhim be musaytir. You are not an overlord over them, among other things. But this battle of Badr, as mentioned before, it was, in some ways, it was the first major battle of what we can call the Muslim Revolutionary War. We have our own, we have an American Revolution, right? But this is say the first major battle of it. It's called the major battle of Badr because it wasn't the first time that Muslims actually had some type of um, con confrontation with the Mushrikeen in Badr. In that same year, year two after the Hijra uh, to, to Medina, um, there was a uh, scary, some type of um, um, confrontation, but no one was killed. But this was the first major battle of this revolutionary war. And so before even getting into some of the details of this, it's important just to remind ourselves of the very fact that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions leading up to this particular battle, 13 years in Mecca, suffered persecution. They suffered sometimes even murder. That we know of the story of Bilal ibn Rabah, and his 
courage. And we also know of the, first, the story of the very first martyr in Islam, Sumayya bin Khayyat, Khayyat, radiallahu anha, that she was killed because she didn't have the protection uh, of the clans. Being an African woman, the wife of an Arab man from Yemen, who himself also did not have the protection because he himself was from Yemen. But 13 years of persecution. And the persecution for what? Persecution because they just wanted to worship Allah alone. That they wanted to have the freedom to practice their religion. To believe whatever they wanted. To practice whatever they wanted. But the Meccans did not allow it. They did not want that to happen. So they underwent boycotts where their people tried to starve them. They had to make hijrah to Abyssinia, as we know. That their wealth was usurped by their neighbors. That they were denied religious freedom. And, and during this period, it was considered to be unlawful haram for the Muslims to actually fight. It was haram for them to fight back, even though sometimes they wanted to. So they had to practice restraint during this period for 13 years. And then on the tail of, of this, after this, this, this period of time, a group of men from Yathrib, they visit Mecca and they offer the Prophet Wasallam fealty, a pledge of allegiance and allegiance and, and an opportunity to take up asylum in Medina. They call it the, the, the fealty of Aqaba, as we know. About 81 men were, were in this, and they gave fealty to the Prophet Sallallahu that if he came to, then the companions come to Medina, that they would have their protection. And so, so this was now the first opportunity that Muslims had at state, statehood. They formed a strategic alliance with the tribes of Medina, including the Jewish tribes in this city. They were part of this Ummah Wahida, this one nation spoken about in the Mithaq of Medina, the Medinan uh, document uh, as we know and the immigrants, the Muhajireen themselves, they come to Medina impoverished where their, their lands have been taken from them, their wealth have been taken from them, they come there impoverished so what does the Prophet do, alayhi salatu salam he pairs them up with, with one another sometimes Muhajir with Muhajir, sometimes Muhajir with Ansari as a, a, a type of spiritual brotherhood as a way to, to, to ensure that people, one another's needs were taken care of. That you become responsible for this brother. That if he, need, he needs something, you have to make sure he gets it. And so the Ansar, the beautiful people they were, they opened up their hearts and opened up their homes and they shared their wealth with Muhajirin. But on one particular occasion, in this year, the second year after the Hijrah, in Ramadan, on this particular day, we find that word had reached the Prophet والسلام, that there was a caravan uh, with a number of goods coming from Syria, coming back down to Mecca, being led by Abu Sufyan and about 40, uh, uh, 40 other Meccans to protect the caravan. The Prophet والسلام, saw this as an opportunity to go and retrieve some of what they had, what had been taken from them. Or at least to, to also take to do similar to what had been done to them. So about 314 of his Sahaba and Saad Muhajirin, they joined him, they set out to try to intercept the caravan. Somehow words reach, he reaches the caravan of Sufyan, he's leading, and he decides that he's going to take a different path back to Mecca. And he sends a warner before him to Mecca, asking them to inform the Meccans that, that the Muslims are coming to try to take your goods, take this caravan. Now, word reaches Mecca, the, the, the chiefs among the Meccans, they start to mobilize their forces. And they head out eventually. And of course, I'm cutting out a lot of details. They mobilize their forces, they head out to, to meet the Muslims. The Muslims only want to get the spoilers. That's all they want. We want the property. That's all we're looking for. Right? But once they, this word comes to them and realizes that, you know what, now this is army coming to kill us. Some of the Sahaba, they don't want to fight. Say, Ya Rasulullah, we just came to get the goods. We don't want to fight. Right? 
Others will say, Ya Rasulullah, we're with you. Do whatever you want. He consults them. There's a consultation that happens. The Prophet ﷺ gives people an opportunity to express themselves and let, to make a decision. Do you want to fight or not fight? So again, voluntary service, but he also wants to make sure that if you do this, that you're doing it willfully, not because someone's forcing you to do it. And so, alhamdulillah, the Muslims, they decide that they'll, they'll be ready. So they they come to this place called Badr, which has a number of wells. Uh, a, an idea is given to one companion, Habab ibn Munzir, uh, after uh, observing that the Prophet ﷺ had positioned the Muslims in a place where he thought wasn't strategically appropriate. And he asked them, Ya Rasulullah, is this a place that Allah has told you to put us, or is this just simply your own strategy, part of your own strategy? And so he said, Ya, ya uh, Habab, this is just my own idea, my own strategy. It's not revelation. And so Habab and Muthar says that, well, I don't believe that this is a good way to station our troops. Rather, we should, we should do is station our troops near the water, and we will go to those other wells, and we fill up those wells with rocks, with stones, so, and we'll create, we'll leave our wells open and create a basin so that, and we place our our, our, our own cups in it so we can drink from it. So while we fight, they, we can drink and they can't drink. And so the Prophet ﷺ accepted his advice. So the Prophet ﷺ, we learn lessons of leadership done from Badr. We learn lessons of courage from Badr. We learn lessons of sacrifice from Badr, right? So the Prophet ﷺ is showing people how to appropriately lead, uh, especially when the decisions that are being made are going to affect not only the leader, but others uh, as well. And so, so this becomes the case, and so eventually the armies of the, of the Meccans, the army of the Meccans, they reach Badr. They turn out to be almost a thousand. The Muslims are a little more than 300. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his blessing, he doesn't allow the Muslims to see the numbers of the Mushrikeen as three times their numbers. But it also does another thing. He uh, allows for the Mushrikeen to see and observe that the Muslims' numbers are, are, are less, fewer than theirs in order to increase their arrogance and their confidence. They become overconfident as well. And so while the battle is uh, preparing, the Prophet Sallallahu he's turned to Allah and he's praying, he's praying, he's praying. And upon uh, a com completion of his consultation, he actually says to Sahaba, have good good tidings because Allah has promised me either one one of the two factions. Either He will give us the spoils of the property we were looking for, or He will give us victory of our en enemies on this day. And the victory actually was the better of the two things that had been offered to the Prophet ﷺ. But he continued to pray, asking Allah and saying to him, "If you destroy, allow this small faction to be destroyed, then you won't be worshipped in the land. You won't be worshipped again in this land." And so, so the, the fighting begins, and Arrow hits the very first casualty, Mihya, the Mullah of Umar um, ibn Khattab, uh, a, 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 the first ca casualty of this revolutionary war. And it turns out that he himself was a black man in the same way that Christmas Addicts was the first casualty of the revolutionary war of the American period. You know, and, and, and so it begins with dueling, three people come out to duel. Uh, the Muslims, they overcome the, those on the side of the Mushrikeen, and then the a foray begins. And so then Allah sends the angels to support the believers. You know, and so the angels are chopping and killing and chopping off heads as well in support of the believers in this particular situation. But at the end of all of this, in spite of what appeared to be a very gruesome scene, that when we look at the number of casualties, on the side of the Muslims, there are 14 casualties. And on the side of the Mushrikeen, there's 70. 70 people die out of 1,000. 14 on this side, 70 on this side. And 70 of the Mushrikeen are taken as captives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave authority and permission to the believers in this case to fight after telling them not to fight. And in one verse, he describes this in the, in the following fashion. He says, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أذن للذين يقاتلون بأنهم ظلموا وأن الله على نصيهم لقدير Permission has been granted to those who are fought against in light of them being oppressed. And Allah is very capable of supporting 
um, supporting them. الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بِغَارِ حَقٍ إِلَّا أَنْ يَقُولُ رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ Those who have been expelled from their homes without right, without justice, for no other reason except for saying that our Lord is Allah. What does it make you think about today? I mean, it sounds somewhat familiar to certain things that are happen, happening in the world. There are some people, you know, in this country who want to keep immigrants out, keep refugees out. Some people are forcing people to enter refugee status through wars, among other things, right? Um, but remember that when we look at the reasons why these wars oftentimes, in the past at least, were fought, was because of a religious threat. Because people just couldn't deal with the very fact that certain people believe different than, differently than they did. And there's not much difference today. There are people who really, they don't like the fact that Muslims believe in God to begin with. Or they believe in a certain type of morality that others uh, don't agree with. The Quran teaches us, That they will continue to fight against you until they turn you back from your religion if they're able to. That these are realities. And I believe in during these type of times, it is important for Muslims to return to surahs, chapters like Surah 8, Surah Al-Anfal, Surah Tawbah, Surah 9. It's important for us to read. This is all part of the Quran. We may not like the fact that we have to defend our book at times. But if we believe in the book, we believe is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there's no need for embarrassment. The fact we may not have the right interpretation at times to a certain passage should not make us doubt or question the wisdom of the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And this is one thing, we look at the Sahaba and they have been fought. They have been fought because of what they believe in, because of the morality that they, they accepted. And which means that if people are fighting you, that they're fighting you because there's something valuable that you have. There is something of value that, that you have and they may want it for themselves but feel that they can't have it or they can't bear it, right? right? But, but there's something value about Islam. There's something about a value about a traditional morality, traditional marriage, and so many different things you can think of. That there's so many things value about what we are. But we cannot allow the fact that people are pressuring us or even killing us at times to, to recant our religion, to, to, to in our hearts. It's okay, okay, if some of you are compelled to say something with your tongue, right, under torture, under torture, I don't mean under pressure, under torture, if they ask you to say something, that's one thing. But, but sometimes, some of us, we give it up even just under a little bit of pressure. We want to change the whole religion. We want to just like give it all up, change everything about what we believe and what we practice because we want to be accepted in a particular type of situation a certain type of society. And we have to be very conscious of this, of, 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 of what is considered to be a worthy sacrifice and what is not. In the meantime, our children are watching us, they're observing us, and if we have any hope of them being Muslims in the future, then you might as well give up that, give up that hope. If you are going to compromise your religion on very crucial issues, non-negotiable matters, I'm not saying not be compassionate of other people and understand that other people, they have issues, and we have issues as well, right? right? But we cannot make haram halal. We cannot normalize sinful type of actions, right? And so, so, so there, is, there is an aspect to the prophetic ethos, which is, which is somewhat is very, very firm, and sometimes it was abrasive with regard to those who actually meant us harm and myth the Muslims harms, harm. Ramadan is a good opportunity for, uh, for us to reconnect with this history. And one of the, in my opinion, I'll end with this, and in my opinion, one of the main reasons that Muslims really suffer so much when it comes to um, grasping and being able to defend their religion publicly uh, when we're challenged on a number of different issues is because, because we have failed to, to study our religion. And uh, many of our leaders as well is, uh, actually have unfortunately made the mistake of shielding us from certain challenging things that in the Quran. 
Because even if you're a person who say, you say that you don't believe in the hadith, but there's enough in the Quran that, that troubles the non-Muslims. Yeah, I mean, you're still going to have to contend with blasting for fornication, or cutting off your hands for theft, or the hitting verse, or concubines. You're going to have to so many different things you're going to have to be confronted with. Islam is not meant for everybody. It's not. But we can't try to change it so that we can appease someone else. If you don't like it, and you say, go, hey, go ahead. Free to go and do what you want to do. We don't want you to do that. But we have to understand that this is Allah's deen. And we have to put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in our sincerity and in our faith and in our firmness uh, in the uh, defense of this tradition. أقول القول هذا وأستغفر الله لي وركن ويساء المسلمين والمسلمات. الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة وسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسير المسلمين بينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. But in closing, I'd just like to say one more once again that. That when we want to talk about the prophetic ethos, let's make sure that we are giving the entire picture of what he was and what he stood for. That we have things, this religion is called Islam, and it means submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which fundamentally means that there are going to be certain things that are challenging. Doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. It means that some things are going to be challenging. You know, you think that it's easy for a woman who is involved with polygyny to accept that her husband is married to another woman, right? I mean, it's not easy for her to do that. And certain things, even for a man at times, to give up your life if you need to in defense of your family, it's not an easy thing to do, right? Uh, but Islam is about challenges. It's about challenging yourself to become a better person, to become a better person. And hopefully you do those things willfully as opposed to doing so out of some threat that someone has given to you and made to you. And when we look at the prophetic ethos, we see that the Prophet ﷺ was not a person who threatened people and a person who forced people to do things. That he did things because uh, he did things for people uh, in hopes that they will be in good status standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he got into an argument with his wife, he walked out. Why? Because he knew, understood that if you get angry with me, then Allah is going to get angry with you, right? So you know what? Rather than allow the wrath of Allah to descend upon you, I'm going to leave this home right now, right? The Prophet Sallallahu I'm not going to force you to fight because if I force you to fight, you're going to die and you're not going to die and get the reward for fighting for the right cause, right? The Prophet, that was his way of doing things. That was his way of doing things. But it is Islam. It's about a, an internal struggle more than anything else. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to live upon Islam and to die upon Islam. Inna Allahu wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma habib ilayna al-iman Allahumma habib ilayna al-iman Allahumma habib ilayna al-iman wa zayinhu fi qulubina وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والعسيان وجعلنا من الراشدين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع عليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت تواب الرحيم اللهم اغفر للمسلمين ومسلمات ومؤمنين ومؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات واغفرنا اللهم معهم بفضلك وإحسانك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة وما يقرب إليها من قول معمل وأنا أعوذ بك من النار وما يقرب إليها من قول معمل ربنا تقبل منا صيامنا يا رب العالمين ربنا تقبل منا قيامنا يا رب العالمين اللهم ربنا تقبل منا ركوعنا وسجودنا وقراءتنا للقرآن يا رب العالمين في هذا الشهر المبارك يا رب العالمين اللهم تب علينا يا حليم اللهم اغفرنا وارحمنا يا كريم اللهم تقبل تقبل منا واسمع دعاءنا يا رب العالمين اللهم اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تهول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا بلغنا بها جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا 
ومتعنا بإسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا وجعله الوارث منا وجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عادانا وانصرنا على من عادانا وانصرنا على من عادانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك فينا ولا يحمنا اللهم لا تدعنا ذنبا إلا كفرت ولا هم إلا فرشت ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة إلا قضيتها يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا أذاب النار وقنا أذاب النار وقنا أذاب النار وصل اللهم وسلم مبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه الأخيار وسلم تسليما كثيرا وسبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المصرين والحمد لله رب العالمين وأكرم الصلاة